Okay, hello to everyone and welcome back. Um, night seven of the Bill of Rights Institute AP Review. And as I so just wonderfully heard Mr. Joe singing, it's the final countdown, you guys. We are literally days away and we know that you're ready. So whatever your reason for being here today, we are super happy um, that you've, that, whoops, let me try that one more time. Whatever your reason for being here today is, we're happy to have you because you're in the perfect spot to review. We are ready to give you all the U.S. history content your little heart desires. He's been ready all day to give you more than what he's already given you all the way back from unit nine to today. There can be no fear of the upcoming test because you're ready. You are. Chill, relax, review this stuff, listen to your teachers. We know that you're going to do good. Tonight is our unit three. 1754 to 1800, and we're going to explore the impact of the French and Indian War on the relationship between England and the 13 colonies. Remember, if you miss any of these episodes, you can go back to the BRI YouTube channel um, and watch Parts or Whole or whatever you need. Don't forget to subscribe and like the channel for great content. And in case you are new to this game, my name is Tracy Downey, and I am a high school U.S. history honors teacher and dual enrollment professor at Ridge Community High School in Davenport, Florida, which is central Florida. I also work for the Bill of Rights Institute, who are graciously bringing us this opportunity tonight. Thank you to them. And it is my honor and great pleasure to represent the Bill of Rights Institute. Tonight, I will be your moderator for our review, monitoring the chat, and gathering important questions to present to Mr. Jost so that he can answer them and guide us in the right direction. I know that he is ready to go. Are you good to go, Daniel? Roger that. I don't think I used that sing? correctly, but... Do you want me to say yes. that? Okay, ready? Yeah. It's the final countdown. Go. These young people are like, what's going on? Um, this is the uh, older generation humor, I guess. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How was your Monday, the week of the exam? What's good with you? Anyways, my name is Mr. Daniel Jose. I am an A Push teacher, been teaching for 17 years. And today we are talking about Unit 3, which is 1754. And just in case you're like, why that year? Well, that's the start of the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War. And Unit 3 goes to 1800, which of course is the election of Thomas Jefferson. And so that is going to be our focus. And kind of what we're going to do today is explore the impact of the French and Indian War on the relationship between England and her 13 bebas. And so <clears throat> the focus of today's session will be about historical documents. What do you do when they contradict one another? Uh, and effectively incorporating those contradictions into a thesis statement. But really, we may go in a slightly different direction depending upon you and what your needs are. So Let's get her done. I do not have a fun fact today because I would like to know what song Tracy and I were talking about music. And for me, some of you know, if you're my students that I used to like work in some kind of a music space with magazine and, and uh, news features and things like that. But what's your song that helps motivate you to study? Like, is there a track where if you're starting to fade, you can you know, put that on and, and you can get back into the swing of things like put in the chat really quickly more because I'm having trouble staying hungry and focused to get to that finish line, which is Friday. So I need some new music to pump me up. So go ahead and put that in the chat chat. Let us know what helps motivate you to study what gets you pumped up to be mentally focused. Um, so we got some coming in and I'll just kind of give us our quick overview while we try to uh, do period three. So period three, a couple big ideas that you need to know about, my friends, and this Google slide deck will be in the description by the end of today, if it's not already there. Oh, some, 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 some gems coming in. Everything from Rob Zombie to Kanye West to um, Rocky themes, like this is, this is excellent. Um, but the big ideas for period three, England attempts to reassert control over the colonies following the French and Indian War. So that's one big thing we're going to see happening. England trying to re reassert some control. We're actually going to get into that issue. Another big idea we won't get into so much today, the colonies react to this changing role. 
They declare eventually their independence and then they become a new nation. So it's important in big period three, you understand that process. How do we win the American Revolution? What leads to independence and how do the colonies resist? And then once we create a new nation, you're gonna have disagreements arose over the social, political and economic identity of the new nation. And if you need some examples of that, like who should be able to vote in the new country? How long should slavery be or the slave trade be allowed to continue? How long should we continue to import people? Should the federal government be strong or weak? Bank, no bank. All that kind of stuff is going to happen in period three. And so the main focus today is this war called the French and Indian War. And I want to show you something because I don't know how the cool kids are talking about this war these days, but sometimes some people call it the Seven Years War. And just in case you kind of hear one or the other, just know that these wars are kind of linked together. The French and Indian War is the war as it's called in North America. And the war that takes place over in Europe between the same people who are fighting, in this case, England and France, you're going to have referred to as the Seven Years War. And you'll notice right away, I hope, is the fact that the Seven Years War or the French and Indian War rather, starts in North America. And that's an important key thing you should keep in mind when we're talking about this war. You know, it ain't the first war. And those ones in black right there, um, don't go, you know, start studying and go, I need to know all these wars, you don't. But there were other wars that took place in North America, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, none of those wars you need to commit to your brain. But there were wars that took place in Europe that had previously, take a look, they all start in Europe and eventually spread to North America. This war is different. And the reason it's different is because of its origin. And that's gonna be a key thing to keep in mind. A key point of period two, which why not just advertise, tomorrow we'll be talking about period two, is imperial powers from Europe fought one another for dominance in North America. You know, this wasn't all just colonization, like happy, you know, go lucky. There were wars, there were real conflicts that reshaped maps and the destinies of various groups, including Native Americans. So there were wars that happened. But you need to kind of understand something when it comes to the settlement of New France. And this is a big thing that connects us to period two and three. If you look at the population of New France compared to the population of the British colonies, if you just look at the map, it looks like France is kicking butt. Look at all that, that red, pink salmon color. And if you look at the yellow, it doesn't look as impressive, especially if you don't include that Hudson Bay Company. But if you look at this chart, you will see there are a lot more people in the New England region, 400,000, just in this little part, than in all of New France, which is all that stuff you see in the red. And a big dispute is starting to emerge by the 1750s over this territory, in between these two European colonies, England, France. And when you talk about the war, sometimes students get confused. Um, it's called the French and Indian War, but pretty much it's the French and their Native American allies. They had a lot of tribes. A very important one was the Huron tribe. They are fighting together versus the British and their 13 colonies. Now, there will be some tribes, very few though, that will fight with the British against the French, but the French are going to be the ones who have the support of many of the native people. And we'll get into more of that tomorrow about why when we talk about European colonization. So it looks early on that the French have the advantage, even though they don't have the numbers in terms of population, they do have the native people who know the land and can effectively disappear within the land during a fight against a foe with superior weaponry. But what happens is, and we're not gonna get into the nature of the war, you don't need to understand all the battles of the French and Indian War. I know some teachers really kind of get all excited about battles, you don't need to. Remember one of the big challenges that occurred during the war was the fact that the colonies weren't very united. And a lot of students get this, this event that is oftentimes on the exam, they, they get confused by it. What happens at the Albany Congress in 1754 is not some plan to get independence from England, which is what a lot of students will oftentimes talk about when writing about the Albany Congress. 
It's that plan that sexy Ben Franklin, that's where he has this join or die cartoon. And he's not talking about join the colonies, the New England, the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland. He's not saying that they need to join to attack England. They're talking about joining, uniting the colonies against the French and the Native Americans who the colonies and their mother country, Great Britain, were fighting. So the goal was to unite the colonies. And if you're wondering, like, why do you need to do that? Why do you need to try to unite the colonies? Keep in mind, these colonies were all very unique and different from one another. That's what we're covering tomorrow. They didn't have a shared history. They have the same mom, but that mom's been kind of a deadbeat prior to this moment in time. They've been kind of doing their old like European stuff. Colonies have been left to do what they kind of please, solitary neglect. And so a big part of the Albany plan was to get the colonies to kind of join up. Another thing was to get the Iroquois tribe, which if you look at this map, the Iroquois tribe is a pretty significant force in this particular region before the colonies really emerged. And they're still a pretty significant force in the 1760s. They want to get them from being neutral in the war to siding with the British and the 13 colonies. Sadly for Ben Franklin, nothing really came of the Albany plan. It's the beginning of them kind of starting to talk, unite, form a relationship. But once again, remember these colonies each had their own history, their own economic systems in some cases, different social structures, different reasons why they're in the new world. So they don't have this kind of collective need to unite. And what, remember what happens. What happens is eventually, here's the situation with the British colonies largely confined to the East Coast and New France occupying the interior. Well, prior to 1763, there was this period known as solitary neglect. But when the war is over, basically your French homies are defeated in the end of the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War. And take a look at that map just suddenly now with this defeat. This is a significant moment because they are kicked out of North America. The French are kicked out. Now, an important thing to keep in mind, 1763 is a pivotal date. It's one of those dates you should definitely have in your brain because it is really the beginning of a turning point in the relationship between the colonies and England. That's really kind of an important moment where things begin to change. Don't do the thing that we've been warning you against, you know, oversimplifying things. It's not like it's 1763, they hit a light switch and all the colonies are like, freedom. Freedom is what we need. No, but the relationship is going to begin to change. And a big reason is England attempted to put the colonies in check following a long period of solitary neglect. There was this sense that, yo, you've been like ignoring the few laws that we do have. Remember those navigation acts, the mercantile laws? You're ignoring those when the war against France began because you started it in the Ohio Valley, some dude named Jorge Washington. You guys were not exactly the most reliable fighters, so we had to send more soldiers over from Great Britain. And now, to make matters worse, when this Treaty of Paris is signed in 1763 and the map starts doing this, or rah, 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 the French are kicked out. Keep in mind what I said, they're kicked out of North America. I do want to remind you just because Haiti is going to be important, a lot of students forget about. Remember, the ideals of the American Revolution are going to inspire the people over in Haiti, partly those Enlightenment principles. And that was a French territory that they maintained after the Treaty of Paris, and it will come back a little bit later. Now, back to this kind of pivotal moment, one of the most significant outcomes of the French and Indian War is England is emerging from the war with massive debt. Debt, 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 debt. And not to mention, not that anyone cared, unfortunately, no one's really advocating for this particular group at this point. American Indians find themselves really completely um, altered because of this war. Many of the tribes sided with the French and the French lost. So not only are they losing a valuable trading partner because the fur trade was very important to New France, but now the rights of their land are suddenly being given to the British 
colonies and the British government. All this land, previously the French were here, but there wasn't a lot of them. They had a mutually beneficial relationship. You find us the furry things, we'll give you all sorts of goods from Europe, guns and things like that. But now there is this question, and one of the big things, does anyone remember, kind of forgot that y'all are here? Didn't really forget you, but you're so quiet. What's the first kind of big thing that happens, the first kind of conflict between these 13 colonies who are suddenly like, yeah, we beat the French, while the British are saying, no, we beat them, but cool, that's cute that you feel proud of yourself. What's the first conflict that happens in 1763? It's not actually taxes. Something else happens that starts to show this relationship starting to become a little strained. And that is, of course, Pontiac's Rebellion. Remember, an Ottawa chief named Pontiac created a Western Confederation and rebelled against the colonies who were encroaching on his land, his tribe's land. Pontiac's Rebellion led to the death of a lot of colonists. And not only did it lead to a death of a lot of colonists, it required the British to send in more troops to go help out these colonies once again. In the minds of the British, what? We already helped you against the French and their native allies. Now we have to go fight these Native Americans because you guys are moving west. And so there is this sense amongst the colonies. And as Alex pointed out in the chat, the British respond with the proclamation line of 1763. They send in the soldiers, they crush the rebellion, Pontiac's rebellion, and then they say, all right, you're not moving west of the Appalachian Mountains until we can figure out this situation. It prohibited colonies from moving west. And many of those colonies are having this kind of like situation where they're going, wait a minute, I thought we fought the war and we won so that we could get this land and now you're telling us we can't go to this land. What's the deal, England? I'm confused. This is only one part of a growing colonial resentment towards Britain. Just one, but it's a start. Now, I'm not going to right now at this moment get you into all these different moments. And you don't even need to know every different situation that took place, Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Quartering Act, Declaratory Act. Like, if you get a little confused, it's okay. I've been having a lot of students ask me uh, recently, my own students, um, what if you mess up a name? What if you, you know the thing? You know the, 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 the history, but you, you forgot the name. And, and is that going to count against you? And the answer is, you know what? The scoring guides are, are sometimes a little confusing, but more often than not, if you're describing it correctly and you make a mistake, a simple mistake, which is kind of spelling or the name, that's not going to count against you. So you don't need to know all these things, but you should know some of the ways in which British policies, as you see in the black, lead to colonial responses, which you see in the red. And throughout this period, 1763 to 1776, what you see happening is growing tension that is just kind of slowly, slowly reaching a boiling point. But it speaks to the effects of the French and Indian War. The proclamation is one piece, this is the our land. The other piece is, hey, we don't like all these new taxes and we don't like all this increased regulation. We're used to kind of doing things on our own, and now you're coming in here and imposing all these rules. And in England's mind, they're saying that's why you exist. You're there, your value is to enrich the mother country. So they have this fundamental kind of clash between these two different views. And this is kind of where we slowly start getting this kind of movement towards eventual independence. Now, there's other things which are in the slides but that I'm not going to get into right here. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is this movement towards independence was a slow movement. Do not make the mistake of saying the French and Indian War leads immediately to the American Revolution, leads to independence. Because if we kind of go back here for a moment, what we're going to see is there is a pretty substantial period of time between actual declarations of independence and the end of the French and Indian War. 
And so today, what I want to remind you is that important thing that we've been saying over and over again, which is understanding the complexity and using your historical thinking skills. There's a difference between a long-term effect and a short-term effect. Um, and so what you see happening is over time, the movement towards independence begins to really build. There's the inspiration of the enlightenment, people's ideas like John Locke, Rousseau, the colonial elites are going to play a big role, right? They were the ones getting hit in the pockets by the Stamp Act. And they start coming up with justifications, no taxation without representation. And then also the role of the working class, the grassroots movements, the kind of everyday colonial figures that start to emerge. And, and over time, that independence movement builds. But even remember, during the American Revolution, one third roughly of the people in the colonial society were neutral. Roughly one third were loyalists. We don't know for sure. Those numbers, you know, are not 100%. And then around one third were patriots. So it wasn't like this was a unified movement against the British ever. Now, in the slides I have posted, we have the reasons the colonials won the war. So make sure you understand some of the reasons why the American Revolution was run or won and then how those new governments start getting created. That idea of the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution built on compromises and ultimately the beginnings of the new nation. And so these are some of the things that you're gonna need to know for period three um, that I do recommend. Um, the impacts, the social and political impacts of the American Revolution. Once again, we're not gonna really focus on this today, but I wanted to put this there just a quick cheat sheet for you. Um, so like I mentioned just a little bit earlier, the international impact of the American Revolution, taking the Enlightenment principles and turning it into a nation. Uh, and this is going to have a ripple effect in the France, French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution. So understand those things and the different impacts, including on Native Americans. You know, for the American Revolution, the Americans winning, the colonies winning was bad news because that means there's no check on their Western expansion into uh, their territory. And then new government structures, like I said, just know this stuff, just some cheat sheets for you to understand period three. Let's get ready for this test and become a push champions. Before I go any further though, I need to stop, I realize, because I've been missing some questions. So are there any questions about any of the content items that I just briefly went over. So anything about the war, the impacts, the causes, anything I can clarify, now is your moment. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at these, uh, these, uh, these song, these song, uh, Rec recommendations staying alive there we go i have the tiger i will survive jazz there's such a eclectic different types of jazz oh this song uh inside of me i don't think i've heard that used on the sopranos you know what's wild is the sopranos is the one like iconic show of my generation that i've never seen um so uh you know I, I, I don't know if I've heard that song, but I need to check out The Sopranos. I heard it was a good show. Um, thank you. Solitary neglect is basically the term used to describe a hands-off policy the British had prior to the French and Indian War towards the colonies. Um, in other words, another way of thinking about it is think about you as someone who presumably is being raised by some adult figure and your adult figure, mom, dad, you know, whoever takes care of you, they leave for the weekend. There's a bunch of rules. Maybe you follow them. Maybe you don't because there's not strict oversight. And so think of the colonies as you and the adult figure who has left as Great Britain. And England is dealing with European issues, internal issues. And so the colonies are kind of left to their own uh, devices, a hands-off approach. Um, so that's kind of what solitary... Uh, neglect is. Um, the Patriots, the Patriots 
are a football team that play in New England. Um, but if you're talking about the American Revolution, we're talking about the Patriots is the term used to describe those people who um, supported the cause of independence, you know, supported the Continental Army, supported the Articles of Confederation, supported, you know, the belief that this nation should form as an independent republic. Um, in terms of kind of their goals and their beliefs, many of them are inspired by Enlightenment ideas, Enlightenment thought, people like Rousseau and Locke, to name just two examples. Um, and they are motivated largely by this desire for independence. Uh, some had other, you know, economic goals as well, um, but that's the term used to describe. So patriots is one term you should know. Loyalists are those who are um, obviously loyal or have their allegiance to Great Britain. They are against independence. Um, and then you have those people who they're like, whatever, I just want to like watch Netflix on my farm and chill. So that's kind of the, the different sides there. Yeah, so uh, let's see. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, is it a version of laissez-faire? Uh, good, good connection. You could say it's very similar, um, but uh, I, I wouldn't call it identical um, just because the, the, the dynamic of uh, England has a position of power in terms of they, they are uh, above the colonial status. Laissez-faire usually is used to describe kind of like the government lack of regulations or rules. But yeah, the, the similar concept. And I'm sure they're, they've been used interchangeably by various folks. All right, so keep the questions coming because I'm, I'm doing better at reading them today, making sure we're good. I don't want anyone leaving here confused. I do that enough in my own life. So here's your exam. Oh, look at it. It's just waiting for you. Doesn't it look fun? Look at that. Look at all those parts to it. So many parts, so many sections, so much joy. I wanted to kind of focus really quickly on an aspect of the DBQ that over the last couple of weeks, I've had some of my own students ask questions about. So I'm assuming you probably have similar ones. And that is, what do you do when you're looking at a essay and the documents are making different points that contradict one another? Like, I, I, what do you do with that? Um, or maybe they don't contradict each other, but it just kind of, they don't fit easily in any one argument. And so it just, it just once again, for lack of a better word, because um, my vocabulary is not that big, uh, they're, they're, they complicate things. Um, and so if, if we were to look at this question, and this is another one of those kind of AP questions that we've been looking at, I'm going to kind of approach it first as a LEQ. So there's no documents. And for whatever reason, you have to do this one. On the real exam, you know we have three choices. So choose quickly and then start writing. But, but let's just say this is the one you knew at least something about. You were like, I remember America got independent. I remember that. I'm ready. Give me my five college board. Let's just say this is the only essay you know anything about. How would you... Or what would you argue? Okay, so what would you argue without a document in sight? Evaluate the extent of change. How much change was there in ideas about American independence from 1763 to 1783? So I don't expect you to craft some brilliant sentences right now, but what might be some of the things that come to mind? Not the evidence. Don't start listing events. What might you argue if this was an LEQ? You got no documents to help guide you. What would you do with this? Because you can't say something. And while you're kind of typing, I'm just going to keep talking here. You can't just say there were a lot of ideas and a lot of change about ideas about independence from 1763 to 17. You can't just pull some stuff like that. You can't say like there was some change and then some things that didn't change in ideas about independence. Like that's not gonna do it. Okay, so conflict arose after the war with Britain trying to control America and the colonies. Okay, 
so that's a good start. And I know it's on a chat. So, you know, I, you know, maybe here's the problem. If that's where you stopped and maybe you weren't, maybe you just got tired of chatting in the box. The problem with that is it doesn't take, like it's asking you how much, and it's asking you about ideas about independence. Um, and so when you say um, that conflict arose, that's not really answering the question. Um, and so that one's not really gonna work out, although it's a true statement, it doesn't really directly address the problem. Colonies no longer wanted to be under the rule of Great Britain due to taxes that upset many colonists. Okay, we're getting a little bit uh, uh, closer, okay? But notice what it says too, and this is why this was, this one's a tricky one. Evaluate the extent of change in ideas about American independence from 1763 to 1783. Okay, so got some more. Although before 1776, colonists who wanted independence were in the minority, conflicts with Britain and Enlightenment ideas caused a change to a majority of colonists wanting independence. Okay. Okay, Barbecue Bobby said, I'm going to forgive you for, for blasting my delicious pho, my soup choices. We were in a brutal internet brawl that almost disrupted the entire, like it almost broke the internet. But now with that thoughtful, well thought out thesis, I'm going to forgive you. Um, yeah, that would be a good one. Um, so we're talking about extent of change. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you could take this, but I think the, the, the best thesis for this question is to acknowledge that it was not until 1776, it was not until later on that there was this call for independence. And even once there was a call for independence, not all colonists were on board or something that acknowledges that it was a process that took time and a process that was not as simple as green light, red light, we're going with for this and we're not going for this. So let me kind of show you why, why the documents really matter on a question like this, okay? And I think, you know, when we're looking at the, the different samples and thank you everyone who put uh, an idea in the chat. I know it's a little scary, right? We don't know each other. But, you know, that's how we learn when we see what's working, what's not. I think that thesis that kind of acknowledges before 1776, there was not a majority calling for independence. They eventually shift because of these ideas, enlightenment ideas. And eventually we have this call for independence. So let me show you some, some, some documents here. Um, and, and the problem with working on DBQs on the, on on a screen over, over Zoom on YouTube Live is, it's really hard to kind of see, are people getting it? So I'm gonna show you my process. If I was reading this, what I might think about as I go through this particular uh, first document. And you'll notice it says document two, and that's because this is document two in a real uh, DBQ that has been released by the College Board. And so if you want, you can easily find the full DBQ. And if you want to kind of fill in the different documents to see what the entirety of it says, I just picked three so that we can kind of examine uh, that element to, of it. So um, take a look. If I'm looking at this, it says the Virginia House of Burgesses. So maybe you know something about that. This is the legislative, the representative legislative uh, body of Virginia. It was one of the first representative uh, bodies in the New World. And it is the Virginia Resolves. Maybe I don't really remember that. 1769. That date doesn't fly out to me, but it is after 1763, which is the end of the French and Indian War. And it's obviously before 1776, which is when independence was called. And remember, let's just say you don't know when independence was. Maybe one of the documents will help refresh you because it will give you a date that will kind of remind you of when certain events took place. Now, I'm not gonna read this whole document to you because that would be rather um, long for me to do. But if I'm going through it, these are the parts that stood out to me. And you know, I know some people are really into highlighting and annotating and depending upon you as a writer, you got to decide on Friday, are you going to annotate the documents because one of the dangers of going too much into the annotation process is slowing yourself down. Remember, what is this document saying? How can it help me answer the prompt? 
What can I use it for? What is the big idea? So keep those things in mind. So if you go through it, this particular document is really interesting. It's the colonial branch of Virginia. So it's the colonists. It's from the perspective of the colonists. It's during the kind of you know, period of time when these taxes, solitary neglect has ended. So contextualizing the document, which is one of the hip skills you could use if you chose this one. And it says that the sole right of imposing taxes on the inhabitants of this, his majesty's colony and dominion of Virginia is now and ever hath been legally and constitutionally vested in the house of Burgesses. All that means is they're saying we have the right to pass taxes. Virginia passes taxes for Virginians. And so they're basically saying that whole no taxation without representation and they're backing it up. It goes on to say privilege of the inhabitants of this colony to petition their sovereign for redress of grievances. Translation of this is we as inhabitants of Virginia, we have a right to tell our king and parliament when we don't like things and we're gonna list them out. But it goes on to say that in humble, dutiful and loyal address be presented to his majesty to assure him of our inviolable attachment to his sacred person and government. All that saying is, I love you, England. I am loyal, I am humble, I am dutiful to your sacred person and government. So, this document is saying, basically, your taxes suck. Doesn't name any one tax, but you can easily bring in an example, Stamp Act, for example. Your taxes suck. We're the ones who have the right to pass taxes. We are members of your colony. We have a right to tell you when we're mad, but we are loyal as heck to you. Kisses, smooches, hugs. And so that is kind of what this document is saying, document two. Now remember our question, the extent of change in ideas about American independence. This document is showing me that there's a tension back to what uh, one of you said to start us off here. There is a tension between England and, and the colonies, but that tension does not mean independence. They are exerting their rights they're redressing their grievances and they're trying to push for some sort of resolution within the British Empire. That's in 1769. If we're to take the next document that I chose for today, document four, and take a look at it. So I take a look, okay, it's Quaker leaders. Oh yeah, the Quakers, those, those, those are the, the William Penn and the Pennsylvania people. And maybe you know something about Quakers. Maybe you don't but it's from the Quakers, an address to the Pennsylvania Colonial Assembly. So we got another legislative branch, another kind of representative body. And this is in January, 1775. Okay. So I don't know what happened on January, 1775, but I know it's about a year and a half before independence is declared. So if you take a look at this one, these are the parts that stood out to me when I looked at it. They are sorrow, they're like sad. The unhappy contest between the legislature of Great Britain and the people of these colonies. They are sad about this tension that is developing. They're, they're, they're getting emotional. Like, why are we fighting? We're family. To dissuade the members of our religious society, we got to get our people to not do something from joining from the public resolutions promoted and entered into by some of the people. They don't want their members, fellow Quakers, from joining in on this fight with England. And remember, yeah, the question in the chat, yeah, they were a religious minority. They were the ones who created this kind of holy experiment in Pennsylvania, William Penn. But very quickly, they were outnumbered by non-Quakers, but they still maintain a very vibrant community and a very core set of beliefs. They go on to say, incited by a sincere concern for the peace and welfare of our country, the fidelity we owe to the king and his government as by law established, they want basically to be loyal to the king, they're united, and they want, once again, to maintain themselves in this British empire. 
So if we look at document two and document four, we have two different perspectives, but they're both kind of acknowledging attention. One is saying we should keep going with Great Britain. They're loyal to Great Britain. And the other one's also saying we should, we're loyal to Great Britain, but we have problems. Now, if we go to our last document, and this is where we're gonna get into kind of, okay, now you have three different documents and they're all saying similar things, but slightly different things. What do we do? First, you source it, Tom Paine. Oh, I know that dude, Thomas Paine. He was that guy who wrote that pamphlet, Common Sense. My teacher made me do like a little like writing thing about him. He's writing the American crisis. That ain't common sense, but it doesn't sound good. He's calling him American. Whoa, it's not the colonial crisis. Interesting. And it's December 23rd, 23rd, 1776. So two days before Christmas. Oh, wait, 1776. That's after the Declaration of Independence. Boom. Starting to contextualize this. Then I look. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Huh. I wonder who he thinks is tyrannical. Article as freedom should not be highly rated. Britain with an army to enforce her tyranny. Oh, there it is. Britain. No, it was Britain. No, it has declared that she has a right not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. So he's going hard against Britain and calling them a tyrannical government. And if you read the rest, you can kind of get some other things. Um, yeah, once you see Tom Paine, you pretty much know what's up. Now, I got to say something about this because I made this mistake too when I was scoring DVQs. Little teacher confession here. I forget what it was. It was something from someone I assumed, I believe it was like Thomas Jefferson or something. And the question had something to do about the powers of the federal government. But it, I just assumed Jefferson would be saying something like strict interpretation of the Constitution. You know, he's the guy who was against the bank. But in reality, it was actually Jefferson not arguing something different than what I assumed because I saw Thomas Jefferson I made a set of assumptions about what the article was going to be about. So long story short, and I don't even know if that makes sense because it's so long ago when that happened. Don't assume just because it's Thomas Paine, he's going to be saying independence. It may be him making an economic argument or making some sort of other thing. You never know. College board can throw a curveball at you. and You want to be ready for it. Back to this question. Here's the deal. Yeah, the teacher secrets. We should create like a teacher blog where we just confess things. Uh, about the teaching profession. They're all good things. We should all become teachers. If you have these three documents, remember what the question is asking you. And if you forgot, let me quickly go back. Evaluate the extent of change in ideas about American independence from 1763 to 1783. How much did ideas about independence change over the course of, and if you don't know this, this is the end of the French and Indian War, this one is the end of the actual American Revolution, the Treaty of Paris, another Treaty of Paris. So if we go back, notice that thesis that um, we had a little earlier from my new friend, uh, Buffalo Bison or Barbecue Bison. Bison. Although before 1776, colonists who wanted independence were in the minority, Conflicts with Britain and Enlightenment ideas caused a change to a majority of colonists wanting independence. I could almost make these documents work for that perfectly. He didn't even see the documents, or she. I don't even know who they are. They're a bison. Here, you see tension. You could bring in some outside information. Stamp Act, as one example. Townsend duties, as another example the desire of colonists to be represented and to be able to pass their own laws. The tension was not enough to make them want to declare independence. They continued to pressure the British, the King, the parliament for change, but they remain loyal. Tensions continued. And even though there's no, there's a, a, I skipped a document between these two, you could say events like the Boston Tea Party and even the fighting at Lexington and Concord meant that the colonies, before even declaring independence, violence was happening, losses of life, Boston Massacre, if you want to bring that in. But not all colonists were in agreement that independence was the best thing. Here we see in document four, trying to convince fellow Quakers not to join in on these protests 
And then we see in document, the last document, not only has independence been called, but they're actively fighting not only a military battle, but a political one in terms of kind of the rhetoric about tyranny, natural rights that are outlined in the Declaration of Independence. And so my point in showing you these three documents is if you can start connecting dots, you will be able to write and be more efficient with your time on the DBQ. Don't look at each document as its own little piece. They can kind of help build on an argument, or let's just say, for example, there was another document from the perspective of a loyalist, which I believe on this DBQ there was, I could be wrong. And then right near it is Thomas Paine. You could say, going back to our question, Although ideas about independence did change and America declared independence by 1776, not all people in the colonists were committed to the colonial cause and some openly sided with the British throughout the war. You can bring in the document about the loyalists to talk about not all colonists were on board with this particular effort. So yes, there is a lot of Treaty of Paris's. I just think that these world leaders would cause wars so that they could then go to Paris to negotiate the end of the wars. It's my conspiracy theory that I'm going to write a book about never, um, about why there's so many Treaty of Paris's. They just like, we want to go to Paris. We need a vacation. How will we get away? Our, our people want us. We're the leaders in this. Let's fight each other. We'll send out all the common folk to fight each other. And then when it's all over, we'll go to Paris and we'll eat croissants and eat baguettes and, you know, hang out. I don't know. That's about as far as I've gotten on my conspiracy theory. Um, any questions about kind of like that document process and what we're looking at here in terms of the DBQ and what you need to do on that with those documents? And I'm definitely more in my lane when it comes to like the content piece, because I find it very hard to kind of talk through the DBQ process, unless you've actually all read the documents before we've gone, you might, might be confused, like, where is he getting that these are the points? So that's why on the slides, it's important that you take a look at um, the resources in more detail. Let me hit you with a few uh, uh, just examples of just different ways, once again, like as you're studying over the next, and I'm gonna do this for our last few sessions is just show you the topic in different formats. So you can kind of anticipate that the concepts still apply. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So this was an SAQ not too long ago. It's SAQ number two, where they give you a stimulus and then you gotta figure out how you'll respond to three questions. Once again, whether or not you're writing that essay I just showed you, or you're doing a SAQ, your understanding of the process of history can be very, very uh, helpful. So um, when we're talking about briefly explain, explain how one specific historical event or development contributed to the changes in land claims depicted in the map. So what happened 1763, British before 1763, gained by Britain, lost by France. This is a very confusing, but showing you the same thing the other maps did, which is France got the boot. So you could definitely talk about your understanding of how France got the boot and that caused the Treaty of Paris, them to have to give up their claims to North America. So same idea, France getting the boot can help you argue for why the taxes between the colonists and Great Britain caused tension. Don't overthink. I know it's a lot of content, but your application of that content is only, uh, there's only so many ways they can ask questions or so many things that, there's only so many different ways they can kind of get to the important things, which is what you're responsible for knowing outlined in the key concepts, okay? Um, to answer your question, Common sense could definitely be some outside information. Um, even though Thomas Paine was the author of a document, it is not common sense and common sense is not mentioned explicitly. So you could bring in common sense 
as like a big turning point in ideas about independence. Because as people read this very simply, plainly written uh, pamphlet, Common Sense, inspired by Enlightenment ideas, momentum for independence began to grow and sentiment towards independence eventually turned into the first Continental Congress. And then, you know, those types of uh, movements towards independence. Um, the question about points should, how many points should students aim for? I'm assuming we're talking the DBQ. And I always been stressing that contextualization thesis, you should really be able to do that using at least three documents describing them as long as it's relevant that should be doable outside information i think is really doable the hip thing and using six documents i think is very tough for a lot of my students and a lot of students i work with um and then the complexity point gets a little like sketchy too but i think four of the points are within reason and would put students on a path towards passing the exam so um, to answer the question, I think a four is a solid, well-earned uh, score and well above the national average of what is it, like two point something. Um, so I, everyone has their different kind of comfort levels in terms of analyzing documents on a DBQ. So it really depends on the, the ability of the writer, I think, which is why I think the APUSH exam is ridiculously hard. It's content plus writing. And uh, yeah. If we were to go to B, briefly explain one specific effect. And this is what's important. Students really, because it's the short answer question, they take for granted, you still got to answer what they're asking you. So it's asking you an effect of the changes in the land claims. So, and it gives you a date range, 1763 to 1775. So there's a lot of things you could talk about. Let me ask you, what would you put? What would be an effect of what you see on the map? Question B. Uh, and while you're kind of thinking about what you would do for question B, Winston, uh, the, you don't need to earn any point on any one section to get a five. Um, it, it's all relative to the weighting of, you know, the cut scores and all that stuff. But um, yeah, if you don't get the complexity point, uh, you could still get a five, but the thing is, you don't get a breakdown of where your points are earned, so you'll never know, even though you paid like $96. Um, yeah, tensions with Native Americans. Now, one, once again, I, I expect a little bit more than that. So tensions with Native Americans, you might say, as a result of the French being kicked out of North America, uh, Pontiac led a group of Native Americans to resist future expansion uh, from the British colonies. Pontiac's Rebellion led to the death of a lot of colonists. Boom, done. Um, another one could be, as a result of the French and Indian War, the French were kicked out, but the British were deeply in debt, which led to the end of solitary neglect and led to uh, new taxes being imposed. Boom, done. You can, yeah, you can mention, as a result of this, uh, the British passed the Proclamation of 1763 that said that colonists could not move west for fear of sparking future uh, unrest. Whatever it is, whatever you know, answer the question, cite your reason, explain, get the heck out, be done. And if you have time, when you're done with the SAQ and you've answered them all, go back, double check. Don't just sit there and put your head up in the air. Definitely. So any of those effects. And notice C, describe another. Please don't re repeat the same one, just slightly different. Last time I gave my students one of these, it's been a while since they had one where it was like, just describe one more. A lot of students just expanded upon the one that they've already explained in part B. They're asking you for another effect. And they usually do this on questions where there's so many different effects that you can definitely kind of draw from. Um, so yeah, the, the end of imposition of mercantile laws like the Navigation Acts began to be more vigorously enforced. Um, taxes, whatever it is, make sure you understand it. The Quebec, you can even talk about like the Quebec Act, which I'm sure most of us have forgotten by now, which dealt with how to manage and govern the French colonists that they now controlled. That's another thing you could do, okay? So make sure you're kind of re reading the question carefully, seeing that it says 
one and then it says another so that doesn't mean keep expanding no just explain the same thing over and over again nope 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 yeah pontiac's rebellion would work for this really well too mercantilism um or the the kind of enforcement of mercantile laws would the the imposition of the the proclamation of 1763 would yeah you guys are getting a lot of really great answers here so i give you fives boom boom everyone gets a five i'm like the a push oprah less money all right, so um, there's that. Let me just show you one more, just to kind of get your, one more time. The reason why I'm showing you these is the basic ideas are the same. French and Indian Wars cause tension because of taxes, solitary neglectance. Here's another way that they could assess whether or not you know that. Identify one factor that increased tensions between Great Britain and its North American colonies in the period 1763 to 1776 and briefly explain how this factor helped lead to the American Revolution. Boom, it's the same thing we've been like using as evidence in that DBQ, it's the same thing we've been using in the SAQ, and here it is in a different kind of form. One factor that increased tensions between Great Britain and the colonies was the imposition of taxes after the French and Indian War. After the French and Indian War, solitary neglect came to an end and taxes were resented in the colonies, ultimately leading to calls for boycotts and eventual independence. Boom, done. So um, there is kind of the process that you're gonna need to do on this exam. And even kind of one more time, here's the same kind of thing. This one is looking at two historians arguing about, guess what? The aftermath of the French and Indian War. So trust your content knowledge, trust your content knowledge. The most important thing, and if we had time, I'd show you some uh, multiple choice, but I'm gonna show you some multiple choice tomorrow and the next night too. Trust your content knowledge, y'all. Like you don't need to watch a million videos about how to like write an essay. What you need to do is have the content knowledge to help you prepare that. That's what we have here on these links. We got review materials that will help you. And I'm gonna stop right there. And if you have any questions, we have a few minutes. The second factor for, are you talking about the, the, SA, the last SAQ that I just showed? Um, the second factor could be a number of things. The enlightenment ideas that began to circulate throughout their colonies and lead to new thoughts about government. The taxes, the end of solitary neglect is actually a different aspect of that. The enforcement of mercantile laws, the shutting down of the colonial assemblies in uh, Massachusetts after the Boston Tea Party. Like there's so many different things uh, that you could definitely take a look at and, and uh, take away from. Um, in terms of charts um, and graphs, I think the important thing is to quickly identify what it's showing you. I think sometimes people get so caught up. I believe we have a graph on session nine on Wednesday. Uh, there is a, is there a dog? Oh man, whose dog is that? Wait, did you see it? Here's a peek behind the curtain, behind the curtain. That's Penny. I got two dogs. One's named Lincoln. The other one's named Penny. You get it? Penny and Lincoln. Lincoln's on the penny. Ha ha. Ha ha. They're both mutts from the, uh, pound. Nobody wanted them. I saved them. Anyways, um, uh, charts and graphs, really make sure you're understanding kind of what it's intended to be looking at. You know, a lot of students get right into like the numbers. Oh, look, it says 80%, but like 80% what? What is it showing you? 80% of people supported independence. Is it telling you who's a loyalist? Like make sure you're identifying like what that information is meant to convey. I think you'd be good. All right, I don't see any questions. Um, I hope to see you tomorrow. I feel like we're really reaching uh, a very important phase in our A push bond. <laughs> I'm out. Good night. That was such a beautiful sentiment. I mean, yes, together, like this bond is incredible, right? Um, thank you to all of you for joining us here tonight on a Monday evening. 
because whew, we know that it is definitely not where we probably want to be. Um, but there are, you know, we are getting really close. We are very aware of how close this test is and how fast the test day is approaching. So we want you to utilize this time to ask anything you are wondering to help you on the test. Please do not hesitate to put inside our chat um, the entire time that we're typing. You know, obviously we want to make sure that we're here for you. And Mr. Jose is here for you. The Bill of Rights is here for you. And we want to answer anything you have, even if it's after the chat, you can keep it going. Um, we just want to make sure that you're walking away from this saying, OK, I really got something out of it. Big thanks to Daniel Jose, who has been getting us through this and sharing his wealth of knowledge as an A-Push teacher. And thank you so much to the Bill of Rights Institute for hosting. So I got to give a quick plug to our host um, because, you know, kind of partial to them. Um, if you have never been to the website, we would love you to visit our website at www.billofrightsinstitute.org. You can find more resources than you know what to do with um, that will definitely help you on this exam as it's coming um, up in, let's see, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in four days. So um, definitely check that out. Tomorrow night, we'll be here again for session eight on unit two. We hope you found something in this webinar that you can take away and um, use on your test taking day on Friday. And we will see you all tomorrow night, same time, same channel. Good night, everybody. Take care.